Here's what intimacy was really like during the Renaissance. In order to restore stability to a collapsing society, Italians turned to their classical era origins during the Black Plague, which gave rise to the Renaissance. Following the epidemic, some people, including the author Giovanni Boccaccio, were concerned that women had lost their modesty and that all sexual values had been lost by the Italian people. Some of the most significant Renaissance inventions, such as the printing press, were rapidly used to create low-cost adult literature, as if to validate these suspicions. Similar to intimate behavior during the Black Plague or on the Silk Road, sexual behavior throughout the Renaissance was full with inconsistencies. While hosting explicit parties in the Vatican, the popes warned their people against engaging in intimate relations before marriage. While cities allowed prostitution, preachers denounced fornication. And although religious moralists declared contraception to be immoral, female doctors supported it. Homosexuality also existed during the Renaissance. In Renaissance Florence, homosexual partnerships were quite prevalent, but the city's office of the night looked into the issue because it was then a capital offense. Everyone broke the harsh sex laws that were in place during the Renaissance. Let's find out why. This is History Rediscovered to support please subscribe. There were numerous homosexual relationships. The Renaissance, roughly spanning the 14th to 17th centuries, marked a time of cultural, intellectual and scientific advances. From European discoveries of continents and shipping routes to new views of mathematics and astronomy to the advent of the printing press, the period of rebirth following the Middle Ages was marked by changing ideas, enduring masterpieces of architecture, art and literature. The Office of the Night was established in Florence in 1432 to look into claims of homosexual activity. In a city with a population of around 40,000, the office implicated 17,000 persons over a period of 70 years. In Forbidden Friendship, historian Michael Rock suggested that homosexual partnerships were quite prevalent during the Renaissance. They were indeed thought of be a typical stage of life. Before the younger partners were considered completely grown, adult men in the Renaissance frequently took younger, unmarried males as partners. However, although 243 Florentines admitted to the office of the night that they had all engaged in homosexual activity, which was punishable by death, the youths were given a fine and sent home. In the Renaissance, sex work was permitted. In Europe, the Black Plague claimed up to 20 million lives and gave rise to the Renaissance. Many communities made an effort to promote reproduction by legalizing the oldest profession in the world after more than one-third of the population had died off. The Venetian government allowed the business in 1358, just 10 years after the epidemic, while Florence's government established an office to promote brothels in 1403. Nevertheless, many men and women despised the occupation despite its legal standing. Venetian traders were required to identify themselves by donning yellow scarves. Adult content was a result of the printing invention in the Renaissance. When Johannes Gutenberg created European movable type in roughly 1450, printing was first introduced to Europe during the Renaissance. And Renaissance printers quickly grasped the potential of the new invention to produce graphic content. Modi, a book of erotic engravings, was published in 1524, much to the dismay of Pope Clement VII, who outlawed it and ordered that all copies be burned. That, of course, didn't work. The unidentified printer has just released a fresh version with additional filthy sonnets. The book, which depicted Roman deities having disgusting relations, was also known as the Sixteen Pleasures. In the Renaissance, adult content had a slightly different appearance. Hen Europe came out of the Dark Ages and Byzantium fell. Italy emerged as not only the most powerful nation, but also the leading patron of the arts. Under the commission of the church and royalty, artists celebrated sexuality in new forms, often celebrating and reverting back through classic Greco-Roman style. 
More and more naked forms were painted by masters like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, partially resurrecting sculptured forms from ancient Greece and Rome. However, Renaissance artists were also enthralled by anatomy and often dissected corpses to gain a better understanding of the human form. The art of the Renaissance is still highly regarded today. One of the most well-known illustrations is Titian's Venus of Urbino, which features a naked woman lying down. To catch the goddess, Titian employed a courtesan. These artworks were created for individual collections and frequently hung in bedrooms. No, the picture was purchased by Guidobaldo II della Rovere, Duke of Urbino, who hung it in his bedroom. Not only was classical art revived during the Renaissance, Italians attempted to restore the classics throughout the Renaissance by reviving Greek and Roman art forms, rediscovering lost writings, and incorporating their philosophies into society, politics, families, and medicine. However, the Renaissance brought back more than just the classics. Roman-style parties, such as those Pope Alexander VI and other scandalous Renaissance men were known to attend, had not been seen since the destruction of Rome in 410 CE. The Pope hosted what became known as the Banquet of the Chestnuts at the Papal Palace, inviting knight female workers, church leaders, and noblemen. The night of October 30, 1501, is remembered for its outrageous or explicit activities. Weasel testicles and hollow lemons were used for contraception. The Catholic Church believed that bedroom activity was only intended for reproduction. But the majority of Renaissance people broke the rule. And lots of people utilized contraception to avoid getting pregnant. Trotula of Salerno, a city in southern Italy, was one of the most renowned medical authorities of her day even though she lived a few centuries before the Renaissance. And in her medical text, she offered some peculiar advice on how to avoid getting pregnant. She suggested putting on a weasel testicle necklace to start. The reader was ordered to take a weasel's testicles off, releasing it alive, and to carry the testicles in a goose skin near to her breast. Women could hold the womb of a childless goat on their skin to prevent conception as an alternative to goat bladder condoms. Prior to marriage, couples weren't supposed to engage in fornication, although many did. In the Renaissance, it was forbidden for couples to have intimacy before getting married, but in reality, this only applied to women. In Renaissance Florence, the average age of marriage for men was around 30, whilst for women it ranged from 14 to 18. Before getting married, many men spent years going out with women. Courtesans were for sexual gratification, not marriage. Courtesans were educated, independent women who worked for themselves. In the 16th century, Tullia d'Aragona, a resident of Rome, wrote several novels. One of the most well-known courtesans, Veronica Franco, was a published poet who even composed a poem for King Henry III of France in 1580. Although courtesans had significant autonomy, they were nonetheless supposed to be aware of their position. And rich men in Venice kept courtesans in addition to their wives and would buy them homes and presents. However, the city almost rebelled when one Venetian aristocrat fled off and married a harlot. The courtesan was jailed and charged with witchcraft after the marriage was declared null and void. In Venice, only women could run brothels. 500 years ago, Venice was one of the wealthiest cities in the world, and it was Europe's capital for Renaissance harlots. In Venice, courtesans not only earned a fortune, but they were also revered as intellectuals. Women like Veronica Franco and Tullia d'Aragona published poems and books, gaining a reputation across the continent. They rubbed shoulders with royalty, sat for portraits with the most famous artists of the Renaissance, and they often lived in luxury. And their fashion, including two-foot-tall platform shoes, inspired noblewomen to imitate their style. While Renaissance Venice legalized pleasure work and tried to protect courtesans by discouraging pimps and encouraging matrons, the city's high-end women of the night still faced challenges. 
Renaissance Venice was one of the most influential cities in the Mediterranean region, proclaiming dominance over the seas. Venetians established colonies around the Mediterranean and built a vast empire on the Italian peninsula. Wealth poured into the city, and it became a crossroads for European trade. And Venice, home to 150,000 people in the 16th century, also counted among its population 20,000 workers, meaning that one in four women in Venice was in the profession. The practice was legal in Renaissance Venice, and the taxes from the trade helped fuel the city's expansion. Venice was home to many different types of courtesans. Renaissance Venice's working girls fell into different categories. Broadly, they were called either Cortigiana di Lume or Cortigiana Onesta. The former referred to lower class workers, the latter was a term for intellectual, honest courtesans. Venetians had other terms to define these women, including Mi Retrice, streetwalker. In 1543, one Venetian magistrate tried to label a working girl as any unmarried woman associated with one or more men. The broad definition would apply to any woman having intercourse outside of marriage, or even receiving gifts from a man. As the oldest profession in the world was legal in many Renaissance cities, many people made a career from it. However, Venice added an intriguing twist to it by encouraging only women to own brothels. Strangely, the regulation was derived from gender expectations in the Renaissance. In Venice, the local authorities was concerned that men would become less manly and lazy if they depended solely on the income of women. According to societal conventions of the time, a woman's salary shouldn't be enough to support a man. Government officials even expressed concern that those who operated such a business would turn to criminality. The program gave women access to riches and power and gave them a role in Venetian business. At the time of the Renaissance, nobles and other rich members of society were typically not allowed to marry just anybody. Fathers instead established unions for tactical reasons. In 1391, Florentine Buonacorso Pitti noted that choosing the bride's family was more crucial than choosing the bride herself. He wrote, I decided to leave it in the hands of Guido del Palagio and leave the choice of bride to him provided he picked her out of his own family. In Pity's own words, if I were to become a connection of his and could win his goodwill, he would be obliged to help me obtain a truce with the Corbisi family. A family's riches could be made or lost through marriage. Families with daughters were required to give each girl a sizable dowry, which might practically put a household into bankruptcy. On the other hand, Dowries were so significant that a family from a humble background may have their fortunes completely changed by getting an adequate one. Gender Roles of Women in the Renaissance The question of, did women have a renaissance, is not something that has not been asked before. In 1977, Joan Kelly wrote an essay addressing this question specifically. In the Renaissance, when the political systems changed from the medieval feudal systems, women of every social class saw a change in their social and political options that men did not. Celibacy became the female norm and the relations of the sexes were restructured to one of female dependency and male domination. Women lived the life of the underlying sex. Men ruled over everything, even through half a century of queens. When England was ruled for half a century by queens but women had almost no legal power, when marriage, a women's main vocation, cost them their personal property rights. When the ideal women was rarely seen and never heard in public. When the clothes a woman wore were legally dictated by her social class. When almost all school teachers were men. When medicine was prepared and purified at home. When corsets were constructed of wood and cosmetics made of bacon and eggs. When only half of all babies survived to adulthood. The role of women was a very scarce role. Women were supposed to be seen and not heard. Rarely seen at that. Women were to be prim and proper, the ideal women. Females were able to speak their minds but their thoughts and ideas were shaped by men. 
mostly everything women did had input given by men. Women were controlled by her parents from the day she is born until the day she is married, then she would be handed directly to her husband so he could take over that role. In the time of the Renaissance, the women were considered rich. to legally belong to their husbands. Days. Women were supposed to be typical housewives. Though women were inferior to men, women in different classes had different roles. Low-class women were expected to be housewives and take care of everything to do with the house. The expectation of working-class women was a little bit different. These women were expected to work for their husbands and help them run their business. They would work alongside with their husbands and then go home and take care of the household. Upper-class women may have had servants and workers working for them but the women were still expected to take care of the household. Women could not work by themselves. Neither could they live alone if they were not married. If a woman was single, she was made to move in with one of her male relatives or join a convent and become a nun. There was no other option at this time for women. 